systems and identify effective, promising, and innovative practice models that alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty. So we really try to be a learning hub for agencies to share innovative approaches and to access those proven strategies to move families and communities forward and maximize anti-poverty outcomes. And then here we have our learning community resource team. So as you can see, there I am in the bottom right corner, and then Lil in the top. Um, and we're available to answer any questions and discuss how we can provide assistance around innovative practices and uh, capacity building efforts for your agency. So here you can see our agenda for the day. And um, I will turn it over to Lil to begin her presentation. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. We appreciate everyone taking time out to um, be with us this afternoon. As Amy mentioned, put your questions, uh, technical questions, please, in the Q&A box, if you would, and your uh, content questions or anything to do with the presentation or topic in the chat window just helps us sort them through. If folks are having trouble hearing us, as she said, I just saw one come through, please click on the Communicate tab in your top left corner and do audio broadcast. You also have the option there of dialing in to switch audio and you can do it by phone and listen on your phone, but it's usually a better quality if you do it here. So today, as we said in the title, we're gonna talk about the foundations of sustainability and resource development. We're gonna look at the big picture first and then narrow our funnel down and look at all the pieces that go into that. So we're gonna to touch, of course, on grant writing, we're gonna to touch on social enterprise, fee-for-service, uh, fundraising, and of course, although we'll have a Q&A at the end where we can do a more in-depth one, I'm going to pause at each of those breakpoints and ask for questions or feedback. But the way I designed this one today, I want you to put an answer in the chat window for us because we're interested in hearing about the challenges of you who are actually on the call today. If you would, what is your biggest challenge at your agency in funding your approaches and your activities? So it could be any number of things, and I'm not going to throw out hints. We really want to know what you see right now in this moment as your biggest challenge in getting your funding going. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to do that rather than doing a poll. Mm -hmm. Board involvement, too many asks for too few funding sources. Ah, yes, the getting unrestricted funding, absolutely. Yeah, these are very common challenges. We share them as a network. In fact, all nonprofits share them. Uh, we're going to talk today about some ways to think about how we do this work. There is no magic bullet, I'm sorry to say. that It wasn't part of your registration today was the, the magic bullet grant writing prize. But what we are going to talk about is how having a strategic approach to your fund development and your sustainability makes the difference between sort of throwing darts at the grants bulletin board or, uh, or dart board and moving it forward. All right, so let's jump into it. Sustainability and resource development. So here are the, some of the ones that we identified. So your requirements that limit flexibility, right? LIHEAP, weatherization, Head Start, any funder comes with its own set of rules and regulations. Some are narrower than others, but they all limit our flexibility with those funds. Unevenly relying on um, uneven reliability, rather, of levels of funding. You know, we hear it all the time. Funds for this have been cut. No, they're not cut. Yes, they are cut. Well, they're cut 3%. Well, maybe they're cut 30%. So those unreliable funding levels from year to year, particularly when it comes to, fund, um, to federal grants. Political decisions. You know, we've all been around as our programs are threatened to, for cuts or elimination. Then there's uh, the funders who expect that these initial investments, how are you going to sustain your, your new project beyond the first year of our investment? Then the honest answer often is, is we won't be able to, certainly not immediately and maybe not ever. Um, figuring out how long-term sustainability works with one small or even large initial investment is a huge challenge for us. Then, of course, decisions that are driven by the bottom line rather than looking at our mission and integrating our programs. A lot of agencies in the country are moving toward an integrated approach, one-stop one shop. Sort of you can tech talk about all of our programs when you come here. It's a big change, and it's tough. Um, 
but it is definitely one that's worth pursuing as you look at strategies. It does complicate the financial picture, so we're going to talk some about that. So when do you do sustainability planning? And for those of you who have either been through Roma training or are Roma trainers or implementers or just deeply familiar with it, you really need to do this as part of your strategic planning process. Sustainability doesn't start with grant writing. It absolutely does not. It starts with what are we actually trying to accomplish? What are our key goals? Budgets are inherently moral documents. They talk about what choices we make, whether it's as an individual person in my household budget or a city's budget, country's budget, but also an agency's budget. So where we put our money really should be driven by our strategic plan. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that you can you know, put your weatherization fund somewhere else, but your strategic plan really shows what your priorities are in the agency. So that's where sustainability really begins, is as you're setting those big vision goals for your agency. So this is a great topic for a board retreat. As you see in the first subnote, it often warns a separate task group or a committee, really thinking about how we want to move these, the agency's work forward for the long term. So it's a good, a good time to do it is when you're getting ready for a big organizational change. Now that could be adding a new big grant, it could be merging with an organization. Those are two examples here from our experience, uh, but it could be moving to a whole family approach or moving to integrated services model, or starting a collective impact project. Anytime where there's sort of a brink of going into a new direction or a new initiative is a terrific time to think about your sustaining, sustainability plans. It can be part of the organizational development process and certainly can involve an outside consultant. If we're moving as an agency from a let's write the grants and just keep them flowing model to an integrated services sustainability model, then it is not a bad time to get somebody from the outside on board to help sort of form that change, help us think about what that really means um, for moving forward. Sorry, trying to shut down my chat window so I can get the attendee window. All right. So you can do this uh, for one program. Obviously, you can think about sustaining a single program, or it can be done for the whole agency. So those two lenses are important to think about what you're doing. I'd encourage you to think about this as a whole agency process that certainly has pieces for each program because each one is an important part of the whole. But if we're not thinking about the whole, it can get really easy to get caught up in our traditional silos. So how do you know? How do you tell what's important to keep going on and what is less important for you? Here is one framework, which is a dual bottom line. This is out of the nonprofit sustainability book. Uh, making Strategic Decisions for Financial Viability. I'll show you the source of it here in a minute. And this is talking about a dual bottom line. So as you see the quadrants, I'm going to start with the upper left-hand corner. High mission impact, but low profitability. So you're doing something, some program or project, that's really making a difference in the community. It is really addressing your mission. It's moving folks out of poverty. But it's either low profitability or no profitability, or it's a sinkhole for money. So as you can see off to the left, you always want to keep that it's high, high mission impact, but you want to somehow contain those costs. Okay? Moving over to the right, high mission impact and high profitability. So programs that pay their own way completely, programs that actually make money for us. We will talk more about that. Uh, you want to invest and grow those. Obviously, anything that generates revenue for you is a good thing um, up to a point, but high mission impact is really the place where if you're making money or breaking even even on a program, it's a wonderful thing. Let's drop down to where we get into low mission impact. On the left-hand side, you see low mission impact and low profitability. Sometimes we find ourselves running programs, um, and I speak from my years in the field, which are beloved and they've been around for a long time, but they may not really address our mission, whether that mission has changed or whether they never did. And they're low profitability or uh, losing money. If they are both low profitability and low mission impact, it is time to stop doing that work. It is time to figure out why you're still engaged in that work. And that can be a painful conversation. Best done in the strategic planning process. It should involve both staff and board. 
Um, there may be reasons why you'd want to keep it that aren't immediately apparent. So that needs to be a real conversation. But in general terms, if you find yourself doing things that are low mission impact and low prof- profitability, it's time to think about why those are still happening and perhaps send them off. Now, on the other side of that um, piece of the quadrant, there is low mission impact but high profitability. So agencies are running social enterprises that may or may not really address their mission but are making money for programs. So the best way to think about those is water them, harvest them, and increase the impact if possible. But many agencies are turning to social enterprise as a a really viable source of funding for other programs that are otherwise hard to fund or hard to fund pieces of. So I think this is a terrific slide um, to really help folks think about this. As Amy mentioned, we will send out the slides to everybody in attendance. The recording will also be posted on the website, but please feel free to use these with your boards, with your staff. Um, I find this slide, um, which is that we did not create, it came from the Nonprofit Sustainability Guide, particularly powerful for discussing where we want to focus our time and our money. So please do use that chat window if you have questions um, for us that you'd like us to address in this, or even comments uh, about whether or not this is useful for you or this is your experience. We're interested in hearing from you as we do this. So there are five key steps when you're developing a strategic financing plan. Strategic as opposed to just developing a financing plan, right? Because when you think about it strategically, it's an often overused word, but it's not just what are our grants and what are our expenses and what's the time frame and what's our cash flow look like. That's something we all do, and it's important to do it. A strategic financing plan is a longer-term look at either the agency or a program or project for the long haul, thinking about what it requires now, what it will require in the future, and how we would look at it. So here are the five steps. You see them in front of you. One, what are your goals? Do you want to grow it? Do you want to sustain it? Do you want to replicate it? Um, what is it you want to do with it? For most of us, if it's working and it's working well, we want to grow it. We want to uh, reach and reach more people. But that might not be your goal. What resources do you need to do that? Are they money? Are they staff? Which, of course, costs money. Are they time? Are they capacity? Uh, but what financial resources? All of those come with a dollar cost. What financial resources do you need to achieve the goal that you identified in the first step? Now, here's where it gets into what you're doing now. How are you currently investing your resources? Where is the money currently coming from and going to? Fourth, what financing strategies are going to support your goals? How are you going to dig into some of the things we're going to talk about, grants, fundraising, different methods? What strategies, or most likely what combination of strategies, uh, are going to be helpful as you move forward? And then fifth, How will you work together to support your goals? It is true with people, it's true with churches, and it's certainly true with community action that it is easy to get caught up in our own particular programs and projects, right? I'm a Head Start worker or I'm a weatherization person. No, I'm a community action person, but it's very easy for programs to get siloed. And funders certainly make it easy to do that with restrictions and regulations They keep those funds kind of locked in narrowly. But the key question, I think, to this entire process is, how is the agency and your board going to work together to move it forward to support the goals that you're identifying? So it is a process. It's not necessarily a short process. This is not something you can finish in a Saturday afternoon retreat. Right? It's a series of discussions and meetings. I'm going to show you some resources to help you do that. So this is the book I referenced, Nonprofit Sustainability. Um, it was written in 2010. It's just as apropos today. Uh, I hope at some, some point they'll, they'll update it again just to keep it in print. Uh, it's available from Jossie Bass. I think it's, well, met, we think the partnership, it's one of the best ones ever done and a great resource. I encourage you to get it. We have a shorter version, not a book. It's a guide. We have a sustainable planning guide. Uh, preparing for your future sustainability. It also touches on succession and on transition of leadership. 
but the first volume is the Sustainability Planning Guide for Agencies, and that is available on Community Action Partnerships website. It touches on a lot of this and outlines a process that you can use to move forward through this, uh, through this journey. So I'm going to pause and look and ask uh, Amy as well. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, I appreciate knowing if that was a helpful slide. I'm assuming you were talking about the quadrant. Um, I think it is too. It's, it's one that I tend to keep up sort of as a vision for you know, how am I spending my time? Is this useful? Is this important? Is it urgent? <laughs> it's going forward. All right. Well, if there are comments or questions, feel free. Amy, do you see any that I'm missing? I don't see any yet at this time, but I will let you know if I see any. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Folks, we know that a webinar is definitely a one-way stream of sound, at least to you all, but we do want it to be as interactive as possible. So please do feel free to, uh, to put questions in, comments. So grants. Most agencies, most community action agencies, we are really good at responding to government RFPs. Whether it's a federal grant or a state grant, sometimes a regional grant, um, it is something that we do all the time. Many of us have dedicated uh, grant writers, and if you don't, that is a good thing to think about a development professional, maybe as opposed to a grant writer, uh, for a title, uh, sometimes called uh, other things, depends on your agency. But there's somebody in your agency typically who's pretty good at this or you wouldn't continue getting grants. Okay. Most of our agencies, though, are less experienced at working with foundations. What may surprise some of you who are not directly involved in the, in, the, in the grant writing is the key to both strategies, government grants and foundation grants, is in relationship building. Absolutely, government grants are scored and written, you know, um, when, they're, when they're giving them out. There's no question but that it's a, you know, a numbers-driven process. But finding out about those, having the relationships at the states, especially when they're piloting or they have choices to make, it is absolutely key to build relationships with both funders and potential funders. I cannot emphasize this point enough. Uh, those of you who've heard me present before know that I love the Dummies book series, you know, Excel for Dummies and Word for Dummies or iPhones for Dummies. They have a great little thing where they have a bow on the finger. It says tip. So I, I like to do tip when we get to a point that I think is extremely important for you to take away from a webinar. The relationships that you build around your grants are the absolute key to keeping them going, getting more of them, and even enlarging them. We've seen plenty of things, and I can, again, speak from experience, where one funder will say, well, gee, this doesn't really work for me, but let me t let, let's talk to this person. They literally took you to another funder and said this is more appropriate. Um, and that happens in government circles as well. There is no question about it. You need to be at those state housing conferences if you do housing. You need to be where funders are. It is worth your while. Uh, if anybody has experiences about that, please feel free to throw them in the chat. We're always looking for new stories to use to illustrate this point. Um, but many, many foundations are no longer taking unsolicited applications for funding. And the question from, from, from many folks is, well, if I can't send it to you, how do I get in with you? And the answer is, is you have to get to know them somehow. You've got to write a program officer to showcase your programs. You can meet people at conferences and different events. Um, there are many ways to do it. Some of them are addressed in the sustainability guide. Others uh, we can certainly talk about in other sessions. We often do that at our conventions and conferences. So relationship building, one of the absolute key points. So working with foundations, here is a guide that I just mentioned. Uh, we have an entire guide on working with these folks. It's repeated three times for a reason. Research is key. There are way too many instances of people sending proposals for a program they love and they really want to start, and there's a foundation who gives money in their area, but it turns out they really aren't interested in whatever that issue is. Sending a proposal for workforce education to somebody who's focused on food security. Unbelievably, it does happen. 
So you need to match up your interests with the funder's interest. Network, network, network. You've got to have a relationship with program officers. Um, and that doesn't mean they have to have given you money already. They have terrific advice to offer. You can ask them to introduce you to programs that they do fund so that you can learn from them. Know about their work. Know who they fund. A lot of them are now doing what they call program-related investments as opposed to grants. Um, the difference can be nebulous and also be very direct. But at the same time, um, what they're doing is they're looking to make an investment often over time and to keep things going. They're interested in sustainability. The days of a foundation just writing a check and then waiting for the report are pretty much over, particularly with major funders. They want to be involved in program design. They want to be involved in designing the evaluation before you ever start. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to download Working with Foundations if you have not before and spend some time thinking about it. Uh, in order to find out who foundations give to, just a quick tip note that I don't think I put in the slides. For those of you who have not used it, guidestar.org, G-U-I-D-E-S-T-A-R, guidestar.org, is the receptacle for all nonprofits, 990 forms. Foundations, like us, have to file 990s, and in theirs is a list of who they fund and for how much. Uh, so you can get a very good idea of what foundations that you're researching are doing by examining their financials. So take a look, match up your interests, and cultivate relationships with those people, ideally long before you send in an application. Even if they have a pool for every year will take unsolicited applications for this, still try to get that relationship going. It does make a big difference. All right. Any questions to this point? Any thoughts? People have this experience? Thank you. Amy just posted the guidestar.org website in the chat. Um, so if you haven't used that before, it's just a quick um, registration, just email and a password. And um, then you can get in and use it. I'm looking for questions and just checking it out. All right. If there aren't any thus far, we will move forward into social enterprise and fee for service. And for those of you who are actually doing this, I really do hope that you will jump into the chat with a few of the things that you're doing in this arena so we can use some new examples uh, from the field. So a lot of agencies are working now in the field of community economic development. And you know, 15 years ago, many agencies that were starting this were doing it in housing. They were building housing sites, or they were helping to start businesses. Those are still focuses today. But community economic development's purpose, and you see it here, we're looking to revitalize communities, develop and rehabilitate housing, uh, promote sustainability, so what we're talking about here today, attracting investments, building wealth, encouraging entrepreneurship, and creating jobs. So there's a lot of moving pieces in community economic development. Some agencies, as simple as having an apartment complex. Some are building multiple multifamily or single family developments. Others are renovating historic structures using tax credits. Some are roasting coffee and selling it to sustain their programs. Um, that's one I'm particularly fond of. I also like the coffee. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of things with community economic development going on in our, our network. We have uh, Kevin Kelly on our staff. You saw his picture at the beginning, and you will see his email at the end. He is our director of community economic development. We have a lot of help we can offer folks and a lot of resources that we can bring to bear with you on this. All right. So examples, and I, I just went through some of those. Business loan programs, doing business classes. Many people do counseling, whether it's business or first-time home buyer, but doing technical assistance for folks, helping folks start a business, improve their credit, do any number of things. Um, social enterprise, which means essentially doing something to raise money for your organization, typically tied to your mission. Some folks do commercial developments. We have agencies that actually own commercial properties and use the rent to sustain programs. Business incubators, sector development strategies. I live in uh, far western um, Virginia in the mountains of Appalachia, 
And so we have things that are looking at helping farmers package produce and do processing rather than just selling their strawberries. Here's a place where you can go and make strawberry jam. So looking at the sector's development is a very common strategy around the country. I know some of you, and I'm going to call on you if you don't put in the chat what you're up to, because some of you have some very interesting things going on. We have, as I mentioned, a lot of resources on this topic. Community action was getting into economic development before it was cool, as the kids say. Um, and we have an abundance of materials to help. So there are toolkits, there's videos, there's webinars. There's a whole section on the site dedicated to it. I picked out two to showcase for you today. Um, and that is there's a starter guide for community economic development. Just like any other field, there's a vocabulary that goes along with, with community economic development. And you have to know what the words mean in that setting in order to do them. You have to know the basics. Hmm, excuse me. Um, so the starter guide will take you through um, all the basics of economic development. Then I also picked out, because many agencies are looking at social enterprise, we get a lot of questions about it in sessions, at conferences, and just through emails on doing social enterprise. So we have a resource toolkit on how you might think about that, how you might examine what you're doing, looking for opportunities for social, uh, social enterprise and how you might move that forward. So fundraising. I should make a quick note for anybody who's like, but I want to talk more about that. Today's webinar was very deliberately billed as revisiting the fundamentals to really talk about all the pieces that go into economic, uh, that go into sustainability rather, and strategic uh, financing for your programs, and then showing you the resources to do a deep dive on each one. There are recorded webinars and a lot of these, particularly in, around the economic development piece. There are a lot of material out there. Amy, did I hear you unmute? Do we have a question or anything? No? Nope. All right. May have just been my dog. Problem with working remotely. We do have one comment. All right. Um, Glenn Miller said we run our own weatherization crews and started a fee-for-service home repair and insulation company that has been very successful. Awesome. Glenn, thank you. Yes, I am actually familiar with your program, and it is. Um, this is an area where CAPS, you have to be, as I'm sure Glenn could, could tell you, you have to be careful because obviously weatherization doesn't want to pay for things that aren't weatherization. But we have tremendous capacity in-house with our weatherization program. If you run crews, you've got people who know electricity, they know carpentry, they, do, um, they can do amazing stuff. And particularly when it comes to low-income housing or folks um, can't afford the big contractors or big contractors aren't interested in it, there is a niche market, very definitely in most communities and in some even bigger and, and running crews. Glenn, thank you for um, putting that in, doing... Um, the insulation, of course, is, is mission-driven. Keeping homes safer and warmer is absolutely connected with everything we do, a true social enterprise. It, it both makes money for the agency and helps to fulfill the mission. So, Other things that I've heard of, I mentioned the, the coffee grounds. There are, uh, there's a restaurant that the, the Bozeman Montana Cap runs. It's a pay-what-you-can, and they use it both for job training and uh, business incubator training. It, but it also raises funds for the agency, and it was a really good lunch. Uh, they also do coffee. That's happening as uh, as well in North Carolina. They're using that to sustain their prison uh, reentry program for returning citizens, and that's called New Grounds, a great name. People are doing all sorts of creative stuff. If they have Head Start, some places are opening child care facilities in areas where there aren't any um, to meet the needs of folks there got the expertise. If you can run a Head Start, you can run a daycare. Um, you already are. You just have to make the distinction between them, of course. So there are lots of ways to do this. There are as many ways as probably there are things that you do well. There are agencies that, if they have capacity, will do fiscal or grant writing for other organizations. If you've got a big, hefty, experienced fiscal department and there's some capacity there, you can help other agencies by doing their books happens all the time with a sister agency. 
Um, again, sharing grant writing, as long as it's not a competing sort of thing, obviously, um, that's something that is often in high demand. So researching, helping, Roma training, although we always want to help each other out, there's an opportunity there to work back and forth um, across that and certainly help each other out while getting that person's expenses covered. So give some thought to what you do well. That is probably where you'd want to start, what your agency does best. But take a look at those guides and resources. They are, as I said, comprehensive, and we have quite a number of them. Kevin Kelly is our expert on the community economic development sector, and he knows who to contact for pretty much anything you can think of to get examples and hands-on technical assistance from a sister or brother agency that has already done this. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Ah, let's see. I'm reading a comment, give me a second. All right, so we have a comment that an agency developed an employee retention program in partnership uh, with a local healthcare agency, successful in terms of satisfaction and employee retention and exploring a partnership with private businesses to bring our model to them on a fee-for-service basis. Awesome. Uh, that that is new to me. We will we will capture that. Thank you very much. We try to scroll that back up. Ken, appreciate that. I've seen a couple of agencies that do um, financial stability and do financial coaching, and employers will actually pay them to bring that program into their workplace and work with employees. So there really is a wealth of opportunity out there in that sector. All right, fundraising. Here comes the one that everybody says, we should do fundraising. And then we all sort of look at each other and go, yes, but how or when or where or what? Let's talk a little bit about fundraising. Doesn't, let's do a quiz. You don't actually have to put it in, but think about this at, uh, please, at your workstation. The statement that an organization cannot rely solely on its state and federal grants and should engage in efforts to generate unrestricted funds. True or false? Well, the hint is in the uh, in the underlined uh, word cannot, of course. It is true that you cannot rely solely on your government grants. They are highly restricted, more so than almost any other kind. And in order to diversify um, for sustainability and flexibility, you have got to generate funds in other ways, whether it is fundraising, economic development, hopefully a combination of, of both. Uh, it's extremely important. There are... In the past, I've seen CAP agencies, especially um, they're highly government grant driven, where the board's like, well, we can't fundraise, we, we, do, we do grants. And there needs to be some education there. Um, because yes, we can raise money and we, we can move it. Um, move, move the needle on this, sorry, is what I'm trying to say. So, next slide. So, the favorite of every ED. Generating funds is mainly the ED's responsibility, not the board. True or false? Well, I'm sure some people would like for it to be true, but the answer is false. It is a joint effort. And when we say ED here, it's ED and staff, obviously, but the ED is the board's sole staff member. But the board and staff bring different resources and skills to the table. This last thing is another one of those tip moments. If you have no unrestricted funds at all, the board must spearhead the fundraising efforts because you don't have any funds with which to fundraise. You can't typically use uh, federal or state funds to fundraise. Check your, check your grant agreements, but it would be extremely unusual to be allowed to do that um, with one of those government grants. Um, CSBG has some wiggle room depending on your state, but certainly not to fundraise, but to, for instance, help generate resources which could help underwrite a development profession. Um, but fundraising as such, no. And if you do not have any unrestricted funds, the board's going to have to step in and help raise the basis for those. Let's talk about some ways they might do that. So I want to do comments and discussion here on this piece, specifically around fundraising, although you're welcome to put in other pieces. Um, so what support or tools would be most helpful to you as you're thinking about it in this moment? You know, an hour from now, you may have a different answer as you mull it over. But what supports or tools would be the most useful? 
and comments and questions uh, in general. So I'm going to give you a moment to type that in while I pull us back to the fundraising slide. And I want to talk about a couple of different ways to look at generating funds. So first, there's the one that most people think about, which is an event. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a huge fan of events if you're not already engaged in one that's been doing well for you. They're hard to start. They're labor intensive. Everybody is doing a fundraiser or a 5K or a Chocoholics thing or a, or a, or a, or a. It's hard to get in there in your community if you're not already there. Um, it is possible. It is very doable. And our agencies tend to have enough staff to make it work. My caution to you is make sure you're accounting for the true costs of running an event, not just the hard costs, the tables, the decorations, the prizes, the whatever it is, the staff time that goes into it, um, all the hours that happen. They frequently don't make money when you factor in costs um, like that. I, we're getting a comment, of, uh, yes, about events. I'm getting pressure to put on a gala next spring and having a hard time explaining why that isn't our best route yet. I could not agree more, and it is tough. The thing about galas is they scream expensive, and you've got to have people who want to buy those tickets and come and spend money at your event. That's very possible. A couple of things leap to mind, um, again, from having seen a bunch of stuff in the field. First of all, if you've already got one that's in your community's rotation, and many agencies do, and they do well with them. I'm not suggesting events can't make money. You just have to be extremely careful. But the preconditions are that you've got supporters who will come to your event, pay to come to your event, whether it's a ticket or spending money at it, and that you can control costs enough to make money. I put to you, I think it's very important to have a dual bottom line on events. They need to also further your mission in some way, shape, or form. Raise consciousness about an issue. So in that vein, it can be tough to raise uh, funds for XYZ Community Action Agency. We tend to be seen as big players, whether or not we feel that way, with our government grants. Raising money is usually easier for a program or a project. Again, there's lots of examples of a whole agency. But if you're starting out, it's easier to raise money for your domestic violence program or your financial stability program than it might be to raise money for your agency. That can go both ways. Look at our fundraising guide and take a look. Feel free to email me as well if you just want to kick the tires on it. But if you don't already have an established base of financial supporters, doing a big expensive event is going to be very hard to pull off. Um, if you do, it's much easier to pull off and you can call in those folks to help you with the event, invite their friends, buy a table, all the things that make large events and galas really work well. So the second way to fundraise, although there's some permutations, is one-to-one -one solicitations. And it typically is more effective and it is certainly lower investment in the sense of putting on an event. Cultivating your donors and cultivating relationships is just like cultivating a relationship with a foundation. Somebody who cares about your mission, who cares about the work you do, and has some cash to give you to do more of that good work or to help save that good work or whatever the current need is. One-to-one -one donors and cultivating them. There are books written on this. This is not a webinar on how to do that, but it is absolutely a key to fundraising. Once you have donors, once you have a mailing list of people who give to you annually or periodically, doing an event is much simpler um, because you've already got a, a community of folks who care about what you do and have already put their money behind you. So I'm going to pause for a moment in this and let's take a look at questions. Okay, simple guides to fundraising, no time to read uh, complicated. I understand that feeling, but it's got to invest some time. Grant writing tips and do's and don'ts would be helpful. All right. Toolkits, we could, we could look at a toolkit on grant writing. Let me check and see what's in our archives. Amy and I will take a look. That could be a, a grant writing 101. Uh, of course, there's probably one in your community, but we could do an overview. Toolkits are guides for creating new fundraising events, how-to guides. 
there are some out there. Let's see if we can't put our hands on some other network stuff or some ones from our, uh, our agency. That's part of the purpose of asking you what you need is so that we can generate the resources that you want, not what we think you want. It's not always the same thing. On-site technical assistance or consultation on social enterprise ideas would be helpful. That is certainly possible. Contact Kevin Kelly at our agency and you can work out the details. Yes, we do do that under contract. Um, talk to Kevin and see what's possible to do. But yes, the answer is yes. It can certainly be made to happen. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm not usually calling out names, but Carilla French, I feel you here. We're in an extremely rural area. Individuals and businesses are hit up often for donations and sponsorships. How do we fundraise without putting stress on the community? If I knew a short answer to that, I'd write a book, uh, a short accessible book on doing that. I would encourage you to think about social enterprise uh, more than fundraising. I have worked in rural Appalachia at Appalachian Community Action. I've worked at People Inc., which is a huge agency, but also here in Appalachia. And that problem is, is typical to both of them, large and small. It's really tough. Um, if events are done to like help a specific program, Rilla, that's one thing I would say is like help our homeless shelter or help. It's gotta be something that really pulls on the strings because you're right, money in very rural areas is spread very thin and diverting it from where it's already being given can be tough and can really cause some bad relationships with other nonprofits. So that's challenging. I would encourage you to think about social enterprise. All right. Let's see. Where can I see the foundation guide that Amy posted a link to? Ah, that's not a guide. It's an entire website, uh, guidestar.org, and it has 990s. It also has some great reading um, on just nonprofit and financial sustainability. So it's well worth looking at. Your agency, by the way, is listed on GuideStar, and you can um, can look at it. Carol, it looks like I answered your question. You are most welcome. Feel free to reach out to me as well, and we'll steer you in the right direction. Tools on social enterprise, Missy. Yes, indeed, there are. There are toolkits on it on our website. It's also web, um, other resources outside our network that are good, but I think our basic guide can give them all a run for their money. Go to communityactionpartnership.com and click on, hang on, I'm pulling up the website so I can see it myself. Yeah, go to our website, communityactionpartnership.com, click on tools and resources, and then click on resources by topic or resource library and search for what you want. There is a plethora of resources on that. Glenn, we have had some success with targeting specific projects toward veterans. Absolutely. And not that veterans haven't always needed help from the beginning of our country to the present. They absolutely have. But any population that's in the news, um, frankly, is on a long-term basis and has struggled, is probably ripe for you all to do some consciousness raising and targeting programs toward that will be interest certain people. I don't want to get into the politics of um, anything, but at the same time, things that are in the news, populations that are struggling, are in fact a touch point for people. People are often willing to give money to support those programs. Foundations are interested in those populations as well. Amy, have I caught all the questions or comments? I'm sh I was watching them as they popped up, but I may have missed some. Uh, yes, you did great, and I think one that you mentioned briefly um, that I see is board training for fundraising and motivating the board to fundraise. Ah, yes. You will see that in our fundraising document, and we can keep on repeating that over and over uh, to boards, but actually getting them to buy in. I would encourage you. Um, there are other webinars out there on fundraising and the board's responsibility in it. Capital has got some good resources in the toolkit. Feel free to use our webinars, including this one, and play sections of them during board meetings. It hits two birds with one stone. A, you get to check off that you did some training for your board under the organizational standards, and they can hear from someone other than the staff that it is, in fact, their responsibility to help with this. It's not that they can't hear it from you, 
But we often find that hearing it from someone else is a key to them finally moving forward. And that's true with not just boards, though, um, with a lot of folks. We often say that uh, an expert is just a consultant with a plane ticket. It's not that you didn't know how to do this internally or couldn't learn how, but sometimes hearing it from other people is the way to go. We have, I think, based on my experience, somewhat of a unique is an overused word, but it is a unique situation with our tripartite board. Government officials are put on our boards, um, whether or not they choose to be, they get on the board because they're an elected official or they represent an elected official. So not a lot of choice. Low income people obviously are short on resources. Our private sector folks are more like other nonprofit boards where they recruit all their board members sort of from the pop general population. But our boards have historically not done fundraising. We've historically relied on government grants. The challenge is, is that that history is, it is changing as we move into the future, right? We can't simply rely on those anymore. And our boards have to be educated with this. Um, they really have to understand not just their governance role, which they're typically pretty good at, even their management of the ED role, same deal, and sometimes even their strategic planning, but their role in securing and sustaining funding, whether it's working with our existing funders or whether it's helping raise money. There's a pithy old saying in nonprofits, although it hasn't been as much in community action, get, give, or get off. If you're a board member, you either get money, as in you get someone else to give it, you give it yourself, or you get off. Many high-profile boards, the arts comes to mind. If you are a donor of a certain level, you can't even be on the board. When folks talk about, yes, you will receive a copy of the slide, we will be sending this out to everybody who attended. And we will send it in slide form, not PDF, so that you can use this um, in the way that you'd like to and clip and uh, use with your staff and boards. So back to the get, give, or get off the board. Um, that is a new concept to a lot of community action agencies. Government officials are like, well, I'm here because I'm, um, I, I have to be, or, you know, I care, but you know, if I gave to every board if I was on, it, it wouldn't work. Low income folks can say with some certainty, or with some truth rather, that you know, I'm low income, I don't actually have extra money. But there are ways to attack both of those, there are different arguments um, to use. And one of the ones is if you do reimbursements for board meetings, most of us do, um, ask people on their reimbursement form to donate five bucks of it back to your agency. It's a way to start. Once you get it started, it's easier to keep it going. It doesn't have to be big. There are many foundations that will not let you apply unless you have 100% board giving. That can be a great argument, particularly with people who can't afford to, but just say they don't need you because that's not what this board is about. We want to apply for a foundation grant from XYZ. They require 100% board giving. We don't have it, we can't apply. Um, it makes for a good argument. And folks can. A significant investment for me is different from a significant investment from my CEO, Bill Gates versus somebody else, our low-income board members versus the local chair of the planning commission. Um, everybody's significant is different. So a significant donation from your low-income board member might be $5 off of their $25 meeting reimbursement. Um, it, it could work out. There are many ways to do it. I hope some of these ideas are helpful. Um, Okay, not seeing any others. Amy, anything else come in? I don't see any new ones currently. All right. Well, folks, think about this. Feel free to type some in, although we'll probably um, we're gonna wrap up here in just a minute. And we appreciate your sticking with us um, for all of this. Um, we actually haven't had very many people drop off at all, which is we take as a kind compliment for our webinar Wednesdays. Um, Upcoming, speaking of Webinar Wednesdays. So the next one, I will be with you again, but moderating this time for Robin Phillips, who is the Executive Director of the National Rural Transportation Assistance Program, National RTAP. They do a lot of what we do and what NASCAS does, but for rural transportation programs. And there's some very interesting cross-pollination that we're uh, expanding and exploring. They work with a number of CAPs already in different areas, and they're interested in working with more, best of all, Though they don't fund you, their technical assistance is free. 
So if you're interested in rural transportation, please tune in next Wednesday, August 7th. August 14th, we will be hosting and discussing community action in the VISTA program, both born out of the uh, War on Poverty, AmeriCorps VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America. There are lots of ways that agencies are creatively um, utilizing VISTA members in their programs. We have uh, two people on staff, or three, at the partnership who used to be AmeriCorps VISTA. I'm a VISTA trainer uh, and have had VISTAs as well. So we look forward to sharing some different approaches to that. August 21st, we'll be back on with Census 2020 and why you have to be involved, why community action must be involved. We are actually running a national project along with Census 2020 hubs. Uh, Lindsay Marsh, Liza Porras, and I are working on that project, and we will be with you on the 21st to start showcasing the tools that we're developing to make it really easy for you to reach out to your communities and help them understand why it's so important to complete the census, despite all the, the hype and the, uh, and the challenges we've been hearing about in the media. So we had that one question about training and technical assistance on site. Look at all the topics with which we will help. We can do a number of things with TNTA. Contact uh, Kevin Kelly if it is um, around community economic development. Contact Jarl Crocker if it's around management and operations and contact Tiffany Marley or myself or Amy if it's around um, innovative practices and we will find the right way to uh, help you figure this out. So we can design and deliver trainings, we can do in person, we can do webinars, we can do workshops. Um, there's a variety of opportunities to work with us. Some are under some grants that we do, some we have to charge for because they're just not funded by, remember I said funding comes with restrictions, right? If it's not something that we're funded to do, we can still do it, we just have, would have to charge for the time. So we have a robust uh, training and technical assistance uh, team that can help you. Please save the date. It is just a, a month away, which causes us to have, you know, break out in hives. Um, but save the date, the annual convention is August 28th to the 30th in Chicago, downtown on the Miracle Mile. Our entire team will be there. Um, and we look forward to robust robust workshops. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of experts. Uh, Missy, it is Robin Phillips of the National Rural Transportation Assistance Program, RTAP, National RTAP, and I will be hosting and moderating for her. So that will be next week, same time, same channel, and we thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you sticking with us um, and hearing about strategies uh, for fundraising, for fund development, sustainability uh, on Webinar Wednesday. Have a great rest of your week.